thank you everybody for uh, joining us today. I know we have the Navy band outside competing with <laughs> uh, our, our, our wonderful talk today and I'm thankful for Sunil for uh, joining me in conversation. Well, it's very good to be here and, and I'm looking forward to this discussion since I think it touches on a core subject that uh, is going to be, it's already important, it's going to become even more important in coming years. But I'd, 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 lo I'd love to hear um, about, about the book and what yeah. drove, prompted you to it. So for, first of all, it's wonderful to be back in India. Um, I lived here about 10 years back uh, for about a year between Hyderabad and Gurgaon outside of Delhi. And uh, I've really sort of enjoyed re-engaging with India and, and sort of being back in the country um, over the course of this past year since my, my book came out here. Um, but the book, The Fuzzy and the Techie, um, these terms actually come from Stanford University and they're these lighthearted um, associations on campus for students who studied in the arts and the humanities and the social science and students who study at the sciences and technology. And really it's about this kind of false opposition on campus um, where we kind of compartmentalize the techies on one side of campus and we compartmentalize the fuzzies on another side of campus. And if we look at so many of the challenges um, and problems we see with some of the big technology companies today, questions about privacy, about security, about uh, sort of managing some of the biggest global problems that we have, it's really this, uh, this dichotomy that's driven so much of, I think, that, that, that problem. Um, and, and so the, the book in many ways was sort of an observation um, of my own background being a fuzzy, being somebody who studied political science and political theory and philosophy, and ending up working at companies like Google here in India and uh, trying to explain to my extended family what it was that I did at a company like Google because they said, well, Google's only engineers. And I realized that it, it was this sort of uh, false belief that technology is this monolith of just techies when technology is in the service of human problems. And uh, so really the book is in one part autobiographical about uh, my own experience being a fuzzy in a techie world and it's also sort of uh, an indictment uh, of technology, sort of saying we, we need to bring these pluralistic backgrounds. We need people coming from all these different walks of life to be able to, to mitigate some of the challenges of our technology and to be able to apply technology most readily to the biggest human problems that we, we have today. So, great, so this is Scott's book, um, which I've just had the pleasure of, of um, reading. And, and I think it makes a very um, powerful argument for why, in a sense, technology and science is too important to just leave to the technologists and the scientists. And, and, and through a number of stories, and it would be great to kind of, you know, have you talk about some of the individual cases and examples that you write about, um, you, you show how a background in the humanities is actually a very powerful tool for using technological innovation, for driving technological innovation in interesting ways. And it would be you know, really good to, to hear a bit about that from you. Um, I, I, I'm going to also myself um, take a perhaps somewhat different position in the sense that I'm going to I, I, I think that the humanities have an importance which is even more than simply how they can be useful for science and technology. And you know, that's an argument that I'm, I'm going to try and set out. But it would be great to hear you talk through some of the examples of how a background in the liberal arts or humanities has, has been helpful to people in, in the fields you talk about. Yeah, so I, I completely agree. Um, and I think that there are sort of these two threads that maybe we can discuss today and kind of unpack. And one is, uh, in this world obsessed with devices, uh, obsessed with technology, uh, we, we have this sort of lean back 
mentality these days where we scroll through Instagram, we scroll through Facebook, and we expect our devices to entertain us rather than uh, the, the sort of palpable engagement that we have to do with analog devices if we want to learn a new language or, or grapple with uh, a book or teach ourselves a musical instrument. These analog devices require us to uh, actually lean in and engage versus sort of lean back and be entertained. And so in this world where we're obsessed with um, devices, um, there is this real need for the purity of the humanities, the study of these age-old questions. We're, we're living in an era where change is constant, and the only thing that's uh, completely unchanging are the questions we've been asking for thousands of years. And these are the questions of the humanities. These are the questions of what is a good life? What does it mean to, to, to live a good life? What does it mean to be a good person? Um, what's the meaning of all this? You know, these are the questions that we, we still ask today, even in the age of Google knowing all the answers, right? And so I think that there's really a need, as you point out, um, for sort of the purity of just studying the human condition. And then there's sort of a secondary argument, which is uh, in the era of this sort of inexorable march of technology, how do we engage with the humanities, not sort of put it in the ivory tower of academia, but bring it into the halls of artificial intelligence, bring it into the debates about um, machine learning, um, self-driving cars. These are the, the topics of today that aren't going away. So there also is this need to sort of um, draw in philosophers, draw in psychologists, um, sociologists, anthropologists, um, because there really is an opportunity for people uh, to participate in this world. And so part of, I think, the optimism of the book is, is saying to people, you know, even if uh, you, know, you haven't been coding or you haven't studied computer science since you were a teenager, uh, or you, know, you didn't ace the JEE and, uh, and waltz your way into IIT Delhi, um, there's still a real way for you to contribute to these debates um, and contribute to technology today. Um, as a philosopher, as a person from the humanities and the social sciences. And uh, so I think, you know, those are sort of uh, this dual argument of one sort of the need to study these things for the sake mm -hmm. of our own fulfilled lives as, as human beings uh, to better understand the human condition and, and why we're all here. And then the second is to sort of uh, contextualize and, and help technology solve some of the most fundamental mm -hmm. problems that we face, um, you know, in India and in the United States. Yeah, and, and you know what, what struck me reading this book, I mean, I think it has two um, important messages for people, young people here in India. Uh, I mean, one is that it, I hope, will give confidence to young students of the liberal arts or humanities here in India, which of course, those subjects have always been considered the sort of step subjects or, you know, secondary, or less important than science and engineering and medicine and so forth. Uh, but I hope it will give confidence to those who do take the liberal arts and study the humanities that they can be part of some of the most exciting forms of innovation and so on in, in technology and in science. But at the same time, I hope also that it encourages scientists and engineers and people working in software to pay much greater attention to the humanities and liberal arts and see what they can learn from that and how important it is to what they're doing. So, so that's, that's, I think, something that I hope readers here will pick up on. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. We, we were chatting over coffee. Does anyone know who the inventor of the text message is? So there was a person named Samuel Morse who invented Morse code in the telegraph. Uh, and really, you know, we might say, well, it was Evan Spiegel at Snapchat. He invented the, the text message or sending the, the picture of your face with the, the bunny ears or, you know, the sort of avatar-like uh, figure. But actually, Samuel Morse, who uh, invented Morse code, surprisingly wasn't an engineer. He didn't come from an engineering background or sort of the study of, of sound. He was a portrait painter. So he was actually an artist who painted uh, famous people's portraits. 
And he was obsessed with learning about sound, and so he started thinking, how can I visualize sound pictographically like I would art? And so he started thinking in terms of lines and dots, and long sounds and short sounds. And in this process of visualizing sound, thinking about it as an artist, uh, he basically was able to invent this whole new medium. And so, uh, you know, that's an example from uh, decades back, but if we look at some of the primary drivers of really interesting technologies today, um, we'll see the same sort of orthogonal creativity that comes from uh, an exposure to a set of ideas completely outside the domain of technology. And I think that's where there's so much opportunity um, for Take self-driving cars, for example. Um, yeah. You know, no, we, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, we, we think of this as a purely kind of technological problem, but if we think about it, it's, uh, it's a problem of urbanization, it's a problem of, uh, of human dynamics, and, and later today I know Steven Pinker will be talking about sort of the, the origins of language and, 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 and his expertise. But if we think about language across cultures, and how do you codify that into a vehicle being able to navigate a city street? Uh, a head nod or a wave of the arm means something different in Italy than it does in Mumbai. And so those are the sorts of nuances where uh, having an anthropologist on the engineering team, having an anthropologist work with the engineers to sort of encode some of these uh, tacit forms of human commu communication uh, becomes the pivotal thing uh, for what's going to make self-driving cars able to navigate on human streets. So it's actually no longer a technology question, it's much more of an anthropology question or a, uh, an urbanization question. Yeah, no, and I, I think, you know, the, the, the sort of larger point there also is that we really can't necessarily predict what the applications or uses or, or importance of a particular invention or discovery might be, that, that, that what looks like it might be useless knowledge uh, actually can lead to a whole variety of very useful applications. And in fact, there's a famous a paper, an article from the 1930s by Flexner, the man who was one of the early directors of the Institute for Advanced Study, the, where Einstein worked, and it was called um, the, the Basically, the, paraphrasing, it was the usefulness of useless knowledge and how sometimes what looks like purely a p piece of pure physics or, or pure theory can, some years later, produce very important particular applications. You know, one example would be, for, example, for instance, qu quantum physics, which now is providing the basis of quantum computing. Uh, and when it was first invented, um, didn't seem to have, it was purely a kind of theoretical uh, puzzle that yeah. was being figured out. But I think that also applies not just to discoveries in the sciences, but in the humanities. Um, so for instance, the, the study of particular types of language and language acquisition, which now uh, are extremely important um, in the sciences. And uh, I, I wonder, I mean, do, do, do you want to pick up on some of the stories in your book which illustrate some of those? Yeah, it's, on the topic of language, I think what's, what's really interesting is um, the liberal arts, if we go back to the, the Latin term, uh, artis liberalis, really kind of, the premise was, was not sort of just the humanities or just the sciences, it was how do we tug on the mind in different ways, expose the mind to mathematics and philosophy and music and, and, and really sort of uh, open up and unlock um, the way we think and free the mind and that's kind of where the liberalis uh, comes into play. And if we think about that, the whole premise was being able to teach and train for adaptability and for the ability to ask smart questions. And if we, we think about language and we think about um, the evolution in computer science, for example, of you know tubes to punch cards to binary ones and zeros to kind of the evolution of new syntax and how we write code, it's really moving toward natural language. It's moving from this really abstract technology language to almost English or, or just hum, human language. 
and it's moving closer and closer to a place where just being able to ask the right questions is now the most important thing. It's not the mastery of a certain syntax or a certain particular process. It's really this kind of uh, level up in the sense that, um, you know, so, so when you talk about language, um, it's, it's now so much more important that we train not so much for one particular language or another, but how to ask the smart questions. Um, an interesting uh, example in, in the book uh, has to do with um, this obsession we have with big data. I'm sure we've all seen a, a presentation or heard uh, the terms big data. And uh, we think of this as a new phenomenon where uh, suddenly we have you know, these sensors that can collect so much information around our worlds that we have enough data that maybe the data now has all the answers, right? And uh, Chris Anderson, who um, runs the TED conferences, he used to be the editor-in-chief of uh, Wired Magazine, and he had this great article where he said, you know, is the rise of big data the end of the scientific method? Do we need uh, to even ask questions anymore? Do we need to have hypotheses? Because certainly there's so much data out there that the data has all the answers. And the interesting thing is, if you go back to um, Sir Francis Bacon, 200 years ago, was making the same argument. He said, with enough facts, you don't need to have a hypothesis because you have the enough facts. And so we've, we've sort of evolved and we just have more and more data. But even going back to Plato, um, Plato made an argument that information is not the same as wisdom. There's a big disconnect between having information and turning it into knowledge and turning knowledge into wisdom. And so you know, how do we train how do we train for those things? Because we live in this world where we have a new buzzword every two years, whether it's you know, big data or now it's using machine learning to optimize processes in big data, or you know, if we turn that into enough machine learning, we call it artificial intelligence. But none of these things are magic. These are all sort of iterations uh, uh, through technology, but they're still requiring sort of human input and, and de-biasing and asking the right questions. And so even though we have these new terminology, um, it's really the same arguments that go back to Sir Francis Bacon and all the way back to Plato, that if we have more and more information, is it going to lead to knowledge ipso facto by itself? Probably not, even with uh, the amazing amounts of information that we now have. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's exactly right. And in fact, I, I would sort of push that even further. I mean, I think what's what's often happened is this idea that somehow science is the model of all human knowledge. Uh, somehow we've come to believe that science should be the model of all human knowledge. And so science has a privileged relationship to reason um, and is the domain of reason. And indeed in the 20th century we've seen a number of philosophers of science and scientists themselves arguing that all the human sciences, the social sciences, should be modeled on the natural sciences. And in a way, that's why we see the dominance of economics, for instance, in the social sciences. The, the use of qu quantitative reasoning uh, as being the only way we can understand anything. And I think that really we do need to resist. And this comes back to an argument about the independent importance of the humanities, uh, separate from what they have to offer the sciences. I, mean, I, I think the question of what they have to offer the sciences is very well shown in your book. But I would make a stronger argument that the humanities actually, we have to argue for them as a separate domain, uh, which itself has its own relationship to reason. Reason is not the preserve of si the natural sciences. The natural sciences are rational, the humanities are also rational, and reason is something that kind of is common to both of them. But if you, if you think about it, I mean, you know, somehow we think that the future belongs to scientists and the past is the domain of the humanities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually not correct. Um, I think that, you know, the humanities are as important, the liberal arts are as important for thinking about the future as indeed science is. And, 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 and you mentioned, um, you know, how data itself doesn't really tell you anything. You have to be able to interpret yeah. data. And, and to interpret or to turn data into knowledge and then wisdom, you need to be able to know 
about the past. You need to be able to know what has or hasn't worked. You need to be able to know about the history of truths, of changing mm -hmm. conceptions of that. And, and, and above all, you need to be able to make judgments. You need to be able to judge whether a particular fact is important, right. uh, how it sits in relationship to other facts. And judgment is really only something that you develop by studying the past, by understanding um, history, traditions, the internal arguments within traditions. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you think um, the, the, the great slogan of modernism in literature and then indeed of art was um, Ezra Pound's slogan, make it new, that you know, how you could innovate with tradition. Mm -hmm. And of course, what Pound was doing in taking that slogan, make it new, was it was actually a phrase from a 12th century Chinese scholar, a Neo-Confucian scholar. And he, Pound was reinventing it yeah. for the modern age. But he could only do that because he knew he'd studied Chinese poetry, yeah. he'd studied the history of literature, uh, he'd studied Dante, he'd studied Provencal uh, songs and from that could develop this kind of fantastically new form of modernist writing, yeah. and, and, and which then had impacts on how scientists also thought about the world and, 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 and imagery. So I think, I think this, this, this simple division we make between, you know, the future belongs to science, the past belongs to the humanities, and, and, and science is exciting, the humanities are kind of boring and dusty. I think that's a, a, it's a very, deep mistake to make. Um, so, so I would go, I, I think there are two arguments to make here. One, it's very clear, and I think your book shows this very powerfully, that the humanities and liberal arts are crucially important to some of the most important developments in the uses of technology, software, um, artificial intelligence, etc. But I would go even further and say that the humanities are a separate domain. And as you say, the questions that the, are asked in philosophy uh, and, and moral thinking, um, they, they persist. I think science has this view that everything can be solved, that we have solutions to, to everything. I think one of the things that the humanities teach us is that there are certain aspects of being human which don't have solutions. They're just predicaments. We have to live with them, and we have to expand how we deal with those predicaments, the, the, the variety of options we bring to dealing with those predicaments. And that's what we can learn from the humanities. Yeah, it's, it reminds me a little bit of um, one of the ways, you know, oftentimes parents uh, will say, you know, okay, well, in this world of, of Google, knowing all the answers, uh, how should I get my, my child to to, to, to read, read books or, you know, they, why do they need to learn anything? Because they can always just look it up on Google. And how many times have we sat there with the blinking cursor and not known what question to ask? We literally have the world's information at our fingertips and we have no questions to ask. And so it reminds me of this uh, example of a, of, a, of a teacher that I, I spoke with and, and they said, you know, how do, we, how do we teach, how do we train students to make independent judgments? Uh, and one of the ways that they, they teach kindergartners uh, to make sort of independent judgments is they give them a messy question. And what they mean by a messy question is it's something that you can't really Google. You have to Google around it because there's no one answer on Google that's going to be, because it's sort of a nonsensical question. And the example that this teacher gave me was um, I asked my students, uh, what would happen if our ears were square? And it's a funny question. It's sort of a nonsensical question. But you can imagine you put uh, a child in front of an, an iPad or a computer and you say, help me answer this question. What would happen if our ears were not round, but if they were square? And you'll see all the curiosities of these children kind of come out in different ways. And what you actually see is um, grappling with sources and these are the same sorts of questions that as adults we have to come to terms with you know scrolling through a Facebook news feed saying do I trust this headline do I believe this is you know well-researched fact or this is fake news um, how do we train for that and the example that uh, this this teacher gave of, of, of teaching you know seven and eight year old students was to give them a messy question force them to in team sort of grapple with uh, what they trusted, how to sort of come around a nonsensical question from various different angles, but really learn to think. 
and sort of engage with technology, but engage with it with the ends of learning to ask questions, learning to question, learning to think on independently. And I think that these are, um, you know, fundamentally the, the same things as adults. Uh, you know, maybe we're not forced to answer questions as nonsensical as, as that, but we're definitely forced to grapple with um, the, the sort of choices we make about intellectual nutrition and what we choose to ingest, where we choose to spend our time and, and, and manage the sources that we put in front of us. Mm. And um, yet... Yeah, no, I, I actually, that, that, that's, that's a very interesting point, and it, 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 it just uh, reminded me of something. I mean, th 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 this way in which today um, we have lots of individual bits of information coming at us, or, or fragmentary stories, fragmentary facts. It, it, I think we all feel that there are these fragments of information, knowledge, and so on, which we have access to. And how do we put them all together? And it, made, it just reminded me that there's a, the, the, the great um, British uh, historian and philosopher of history, um, R.G. Collingwood, uh, who, who taught in Oxford in the early part of the 20th century. And Collingwood, um, he, he's, he wrote a very interesting autobiography uh, about his own intellectual life. And in that, he, he talks about his early interest in archaeology. And of course, archaeology is precisely dealing with fragments. It's dealing with fragments of clay pots, of bits of old tools, things which you don't even know what they may have been, but you know they're old and belong to some civilization or culture of the past. And you know, Collingwood says, well, how does an archaeologist start to put these together? How does he start to, or she, start to reconstruct what these fragments tell us, the world they speak about? And, and he sort of shows how the, the, the kind of archaeological method, and then indeed the historian's method, provides us a way of reconstructing that world which we have no full access to. We don't have all the details. Uh, but we've got these little bits and pieces, and we have to use interpretation, judgment, testing of what is uh, not plausible or credible as a supposition to make about them. And in a sense, that's our condition today, our condition in relation to knowledge today. We don't have the full story often, but we have to fit the bits together. So that would be another example of where what looks like a kind of literally dusty old method, archaeology, can actually give us an intellectual training in how we sift through the dirt and de to find the fragments that actually speak, how we separate out the fake news from the one, the, 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 those bits that are actually true and can be put together into a credible story. So I think there's a lot, a lot that we still um, you know, have to learn from these what look like outdated or archaic approaches and methods. Yeah, there's a there's a fantastic. I think you know Apple uh, is is one company that has done a good job of integrating the humanities. I think into the culture and the ethos of, of the business. And part of that was probably because you know St Steve Jobs famously in 2007 put up the slide at um, when he announced the iPhone. He said, you know, really the innovation at Apple is because we have the liberal arts and technology at an intersection. And uh, you know, it was his own background studying things like calligraphy that led to the evolution of fonts and the evolution of uh, you know, the what you see is what you're going to get interface that we all take for granted today uh, of you know, f the metaphors that exist in the form of files on a desktop. Uh, that metaphorical way of thinking visually was an innovation you know, t 20 years ago. And, um, so interestingly, at Apple, they have uh, this thing called Apple University, where they bring in professors and people uh, from all different backgrounds and, and lines of thinking. And some of the most interesting lectures, um, one of them is given by a moral philosopher, a guy named uh, Josh Cohen. And Josh studied moral philosophy under John Rawls. Um, he's taught at four or five preeminent universities. He's not a technologist, but he comes into Apple and he's delivered lectures on things um, as kind of esoteric as the design of Central Park in New York City. And he has this one lecture on Frederick Law Olmsted and the design of Central Park. And at the time that Central Park was created, um, it was really about democratizing nature because 
the city was this urban, gritty dwelling where people uh, below a certain social stature could never escape the city. They could never see trees. They just lived in this, uh, this kind of mired urban environment. And so the whole idea of, uh, of Central Park was to bring nature into the city. It was to democratize nature for people that didn't, didn't have access to nature. And so in the design of Central Park, Olmsted actually made all of the paths curved. So there's only one straight path in all of Central Park, and it's the arcade. And everything else is a curved path because it's meant to provide this sort of unfurling of nature as would be in the natural world, uh, where you could take somebody who didn't experience being in the forest, and they could experience what it's like to go on a walk in the woods. Um, and so the whole idea was uh, to democratize nature and to sort of you know, use this ethos uh, to inform the product development, which was Central Park. And so you think, well, what does that ha have anything to do with Apple Computer? But you, you give this lecture to a room full of 200 engineers designing the iPhone, and you can see that there are elements of um, simplicity and beauty and sort of uh, democratizing certain features that uh, probably make their way into how those designers think through the product. Um, so these, these sort of observations of the natural world, whether it's archaeology or um, really funny aside, uh, even designers that, that have things like uh, the slide lock on the Apple iPhone, you might say, well, where did the slide lock come from? Um, there's actually a, a friend of mine, and he was flying back and forth. He lives in Brooklyn, New York, and he was working on Steve Jobs and Johnny Ives' d intimate design team, and Steve Jobs said, my phone is always calling people in my pocket. Fix this. And on his perennial flights back and forth between New York and San Francisco, uh, my friend was waiting in line for the, the, the bathroom on the plane. And he realized that that little slide lock on the airplane bathroom is kind of a universal way that people understand lock and unlock. And so he, he said, you know, my job as a designer is to take, take things from the analog world and translate them to the digital realm. And so it was that innovation, it was that observation of the world that, um, so I, th I think that we have these lessons all around us, whether it's study of the humanities, study of archeology, span the study of design, these, these translations that kind of uh, bring things out of the dusty context and are very, very relevant in sort of even the digital format that we, that we navigate today. Um, but the other, the other response uh, in, in thinking about the fragments that we sort of uh, deal with on a daily basis is we also operate under the notion that we have access to uh, the full menu of choices. Like as we interface with our devices, that we're making independent decisions as individuals with our own agency, when in fact what we're doing is we're kind of hopscotching our way through a set of menus that have been designed for us by designers and engineers. So we, we have this sort of, it's almost thinking about those, those, those dusty pieces of archaeology, but we're kind of hopscotching our way through a menu of those pieces that have been chosen for us, even though we think that we have our own agency. Um, and you know, examples of this abound, but when you, you navigate through any app on your phone, you realize that that app has been optimized to navigate you in a certain way through that uh, through that device to obtain an outcome. And uh, there's no better example to me than uh, if, you, if you go to New York City or you get into you know, an Uber cab and you think about tipping the driver, um, you think, well, I'm gonna make my own decision about what I tip the driver. But in a place like New York, there's actually, uh, there's a screen in the back of a taxi. And for any ride over $15, that screen has three buttons on it. It says 20%, 25%, and 30%. And that's the tip. You can pick whichever button you want, or you can pick a tiny button in the corner and input your own tip. But most people don't do that. Most people pick the middle button because they don't want to be too cheap and they don't have a lot of extra cash. And what happened a couple years ago was uh, the, the menu changed. So the taxi authority changed the menu from being 15, 20, 25 to being 20, 25, and 30. And two professors, uh, one at Columbia, one at the University of Chicago, did a study where they looked at you know, 20,000 or so rides and they said, what is, 
what is, what's happened uh, given that the menu changed? Of course, people are their own independent actors. They make their own in, informed decisions as, as thoughtful, thoughtful people. But it turns out that drivers now make $6,000 more a year because they changed the menu of choices in the tipping button. And so it's a, it's a pure example of, uh, I think, as we navigate our world and we think that we're making these informed choices, uh, we're kind of hopscotching our way through these, these, these dusty pieces, through these menus uh, that, that have been sort of designed for us. And so, you know, how do we train for asking the right questions? How do we train for independent thinking, sort of taking a step back and saying, well, what is it that this menu is optimizing my choices for? And how do I either agree with that or disagree with that, but try to make an independent, informed decision, uh, a values-based decision of how I want to interact with that technology? Mm. Yeah. yeah, no, certainly. I mean, this, this point about how menus can define choices, and therefore the skepticism with which also you need to kind of see the choices that are given to you by, by some of this technology. I, I just wanted to kind of throw in one last point, and then maybe we should um, get some questions. Um, but I think this point about the importance of the humanities for thinking about the future of our society, the future of our democracy, in a sense, is really important here and now. Um, because, you know, what's happening otherwise is that those fields of the humanities, like history, like archaeology, like the study of literature, classical literatures and languages, are being left to, unfortunately, to people who don't really have, or rather who want to use those subjects for particular political purposes. And I think that they're far too important uh, to leave to that. So, for example, the study of Sanskrit today. I mean, we have in India literally hundreds of thousands of manuscripts, for instance, on Sans in Sanskrit, on mathematics or astronomy or, or you know, on sort of scientific subjects, but hardly any of those have even begun to be read. Uh, we, have, we have a very poor understanding, for instance, of the history of science in India. Um, few scholars working on it. Uh, but you need to be able to master Sanskrit, you need to be able to understand historical conceptions of cosmology, of time, etc. And what happens is that those subjects then get left to people who want to use those subjects for political ends, uh, for particular kinds of nationalist ends or whatever they might be. And I think that's a great loss uh, of, of a resource uh, for our own society. So the argument is that I think one has to defend the autonomy of the humanities in relation to the sciences but also to defend the fact that the, in the humanities, it's, it's about the pursuit of truth. And that means the, the reading of documents, the study of archives. The, and unfortunately, more generally, I think the humanities have lost that conf self-confidence, that it's about the pursuit of truth. And so certainly, you see this in, in the way the humanities are studied, for instance, in the US and so on, that there's, there's a loss of confidence uh, uh, about about that commitment, and there's a kind of, to use shorthand, a kind of relativism which, which runs through uh, so much of the study of the humanities, and it actually generates, curiously enough, a kind of intellectual narcissism. Mm -hmm. So it's a, self, a narcissism bo born of a loss of self-confidence. But I think if we can return to the way, the, 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 the place of reason and truth in the humanities, which has somehow been ceded to the sciences, mm -hmm. Uh, I think that, that, I think, is a very important move we need to bring about. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really important point because going back to this idea that um, big data or the collection of, you know, nearly infinite amounts of information will just make this cosmic leap to knowledge and wisdom, um, we sort of overlook the fact that you can find, uh, you can hopscotch your way to some answer um, in the data if you're but it, it comes back to sort of the intellectual purity of how you're asking the question or yeah. what the vector is through, because you can prove nearly any outcome yeah. in nearly infinite data. And so it comes back to, and there's actually a, a, a quote um, 
in the book by an author of, of another great book um, called Weapons of Math Destruction, and she's a data scientist, but she talks about some of the dangers of kind of looking at, at data science as being this sort of and machine learning as sort of solving, solving all. And she says that basically data is not just about, our machine learning is not just about sort of the optimization of a process. There's a fundamentally moral decision in which data to pay attention to and which data to exclude and how to define the taxonomies of how we think about those data. And so it comes down to exactly what you're saying, the sort of purity of asking the questions without regard for the proof points that right. define it. Uh, absolutely, but at the same time, the, the, the ability or the wi willingness of the humanities to use the tools of technology and science to, ask, to pursue these questions. So for instance, um, you know, you've seen in literary criticism the emergence of what's called computational criticism, where you run, for example, an entire corpus of the 19th century novel uh, through computers to search for particular words, you know, the bourgeois novels, so words like efficiency or utility or, or uh, you know, prosperity or whatever they might be. And you see certain patterns. And then if you bring, as you say, the right set of questions, the right interpretative judgments, you can actually say some quite interesting things about it. But simply to run the word searches is not going to tell you very much. Or similarly in art history, the use of spectop spectroscopy to study pigments and, and, and the kinds of paints. I mean, th th that can give you fascinating insights in a, into art history, but you have to be able to ask the right questions there. Yeah, and I think you're touching on a, this really interesting fallacy between uh, being able to uh, deconstruct something through technology and being able to create something through technology. And I think, you know, we, we look at a machine learning process and we say, well, we can analyze every word of Tolstoy, we can do language clusters around character development, and we can understand from a data-driven perspective exactly what Tolstoy is. But we forget that if we deconstruct it down to that level, we still, we haven't generated the pathos, we haven't generated the, the emotional uh, feeling that you get from reading a great book of literature yet we think that we could recreate that because we've been able to deconstruct the, the structure of it. And so I, I think that we, as we think about the power of technology today, we sort of make this leap of, well, because we can deconstruct it, therefore we can create it through technology. When that process, the creative process, the human experience, the pathos that comes into uh, in a great book of literature, um, you know, many uh, of those authors are around us uh, at this festival. Um, it's a fundamentally different thing, and that's where I'm ultimately very optimistic about the human uh, involvement in the sort of future of work, if we get to this very transactional, uh, where the rubber hits the road and people say, are there any jobs for humans in the future because we've got all this technology? And I'd say a resounding absolute yes, because there's this huge leap between what computers can optimize for and sort of the generative creativity that is, is sort of required uh, to, 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 to do this. And, and, and so, you know, the, and the question kind of comes back to how do we train for these soft skills, you know, in a world of uh, machines doing the more routine, rote aspects of our world, actually what's left over are these, these very kind of soft human skills of uh, having empathy, being able to communicate, having creativity to reflect and stitch together disparate thoughts. And uh, so, you know, that's maybe where um, this idea of the value of the liberal arts and sort of tugging on the mind from these various perspectives uh, is an attempt sort of through history to, is this a positive way to perhaps train for adaptability, train for creativity, train for the ability to work on teams and I would actually call them yeah. hard skills, not soft skills. Yeah. I think I think it's a kind of um, conceding too much to describe. Much. I think they're really are the hard skills. You're right, exactly. But should we should we kind of throw so, it open to, to speaking of asking questions? Uh, yeah, well, let's open it up to the audience. Looks like there's one in the second row. Yeah, there are lots of hands up. But um, hello. I think my daughter was trying to apply for liberal arts. The traditional question by my neighbor. What job she'll be get after she passes liberal arts? Because there's a concept that you pass IIT, IIM, you got an offer, so you know. So I told them I'm preparing for life. Then she said you're pretty idealistic. So that is one of the mindset of the parents in India. 
to take liberal arts. After liberal arts, what do we look at? So how do we convince such parents to encourage the kids to take liberal arts? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So um, I, th I think what's, what's true about today's world is that a, a single degree, whether it's called English literature or it's called computer science, is not sort of a, a ticket to a relevant destination in the future or an irrelevant destination in the future. These are just different, uh, different passions that people have, right? Some people love computer engineering, other people love reading literature, and there's nothing wrong with either of them. Um, I think we, we, we're moving is to a world where skill development has to happen more holistically throughout life because the pace of change is so rapid. And uh, you know, I live my world mostly in Silicon Valley where there's just this constant drive of change. And so what's really interesting actually is if you graduate with a degree in computer science, the presumption is, okay, you've got this sort of carte blanche ticket to the future, when in reality, um, those are the students that take most of the coding boot camps to upskill in new languages, to stay relevant in the kind of changing evolution of, of computers, uh, are the computer scientists. They don't graduate with a sort of ticket to, to relevance. So I would say, you know, to, 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 no matter what you study, I think, um, you know, the purity of, of, of studying these things on their own for their own accord is, is important. But there's also sort of this reality check that we all have to continually engage with technology. It's part of our world. We have to upskill in, in new ways. And so um, the advantage that your daughter has is that she's even exposed to this life and world of, of literature and this life and world of, of, of thinking in a different way. And she's not locked out from taking a, a two-week or a 10-week boot camp to, to learn a particular part of technology. And I'd say with that combined fuzzy and techie, that's actually where there's a ton of opportunity um, is sort of in, in the engagement of both sides. Um, so, so I think we have to get past this, um, this idea that one degree is a plane ticket to nowhere and one is a plane ticket to a relevant place. And it's really more about skill development on a much more modular, much more rapid basis. Um, and I think that uh, if I look at my, my, my own degrees, you know, in, computer, in political science uh, and the things that I've been forced to learn on the job and forced to learn over the past uh, number of years, uh, it's very much this sort of, in all of our careers, uh, this iterative process where we have to kind of continually redevelop and upskill. Yeah. Hello. Mm. Just See. an observation. Um, there is no need to be defensive about humanities being relegated to a second position because that's not how my generation took it. Mm -hmm. The common saying while I was growing up was that a generation of grandfathers tilled the land so that their sons could go to the engineering college and they worked in technology world so that their children could study poetry and painting and humanities and liberal arts. So the whole divide is about immediate job and a career. Career is longer and has a lifestyle. And technology tends to give immediate jobs. So for those job seekers, probably there is a hierarchy. But for the rest of the people, it's about life, it's about tolerance of ambiguity, uncertainty, being a sensate participant in democracy, yeah. or being in the pursuit of knowledge. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg had to leave the, the dinner table and the girlfriend didn't even want to tolerate him for two minutes and then he went and in, invented the Facebook. So you live in a society and my question is that it is not either or. Let us eliminate either or with end. We, humanities people need uh, science and technology because they are users of it. And the same way, all yeah. Trump needs a sociologist. <laughs> Every prime minister struggling with immigration needs a sociologist. So, you know, let's eliminate that hierarchy and promote not either or but end because at the end of the day, it's about lifestyle and thinking in a better 
situation. You can respond to yeah, any I'll of them. Just, just very quickly, since we should take more questions, but I think you're absolutely right. I mean, in a sense, the question is not either or. Of course, we need both kinds, but I think it's also, as you touched on this, it's, it's what kinds of knowledge is, does, does a democracy need? If we're to sustain ourselves as a democratic society, what kind of knowledges do we need? And of course, part of the kind of knowledge we need is instrumental. It is about being able to solve certain kinds of problems. But we also need the kind of knowledge that the humanities generate. You mentioned the understanding of ambiguity, the kind of living with uncertainty, etc. I think those are all exactly right. And uh, unfortunately, I think the humanities have been somewhat sort of in, re in recession. Uh, certainly here in our country, we have much, much more work to do in the development of the humanities. I mean, you know, if we look at the range of literary, of, of, of human knowledge that's buried in our literatures, for instance, we're hardly starting to touch that in terms of bringing it into the modern discussion of our society. So we'll just stop and maybe take yeah. some more. Yeah. more. Yes. There are someone in the, in the back. Oh, in the we back. should only give priority to yeah. the <laughs> I, Good afternoon. Enjoyed listening, fuzzy and techy. I come from technology and going towards fuzziness. A simple question, you know, I work a lot of human values and human ethos. How, do, how does uh, value systems or ethics or behavioral science gets embedded with emotions into artificial intelligence when real intelligence already is struggling to achieve it? I think, I think you make a great point that um, these technologies that we think of as separate and objective because they're rooted in math are reflective of human values, reflective of human biases, reflective of lots of, 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 of problems we have in society. Just a really quick uh, anecdote around um, predictive policing. You know, we, we look at big data again uh, in, in cities uh, like Chicago in America that have high rates of violent crime. And you say, well, if we have knowledge of where the crimes are occurring, certainly we can use AI and machine learning to uh, send, mach send officers to the right place at the right time. But it's, uh, it loses the fact that th there's no context there. And we don't know where all crimes happen. We know where reported crimes happen. And reported crimes are reflective of sociology, urbanization, poverty, who feels safe to report crimes, who doesn't feel safe to report crimes. So by purely pumping that data through something that we think of as objective and as mathematically driven and uh, having this sort of uh, purity of technology, purity of, of truth, uh, we're actually just pumping the same human biases through this new thing. Uh, we, this, so, so absolutely to your point, I mean, until we figure out the human condition, until we study the humanities, uh, so deeply that we understand it, our technology will be just as fallible as, uh, as humans, human beings are. Scott, yeah. a quick question here at the back. Yeah. Oh, Firstly, hi. thank you for writing The Fuzzy and the Techie. I do believe it's one of the best books I read in all of 2018. It thank comes so at an much. important point because I work for a software product company and I have conversations with my colleagues who have children and I notice a rather disturbing trend that a lot of them send their kids to summer coding camps, kids who are as young as eight or nine years old. So in my time during summer you would go to a camp which taught you to play cricket or you would read books or you would swim, but kids as young as eight-year-olds being taught to code without the context so what they learn is probably just the syntax, but isn't being a programmer much more than just learning the syntax of a language? Just wanted to get your thoughts on that. There's, there's, a, great, um, there's a great quote. Well, first of all, thank you so much for your comment. Uh, I think every author will say they deeply appreciate when they hear a comment like that. So thank you very much. Um, I, so there's, a, there's a great article in Vanity Fair by an author named Nick Bilton, and he said the primary question that entrepreneurs these days are asking themselves when they're solving a problem is, what is something my mother once did for me that I can invent technology to now do for me? Uh, whether it's deliver a car, deliver me food, deliver... And it's this sort of lack of zooming out 
and asking the big questions, the societal questions, the, the, the questions of uh, kind of fundamental, fundamentally the human condition and how, what, what do we want to see in the world and improve in the world through technology. And so I, I absolutely agree with you. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's important to learn these new languages as they evolve. Um, the syntax will change every two years throughout our lives. Um, so certainly engaging with technology is important, but absolutely to your point, you know, it's, it's this context and being able to solve for bigger questions, bigger problems, I think that, uh, you know, whether we're in Bangalore or San Francisco, uh, we all need to think about. Should we take one more last question? Yeah. Yeah. Just, yes, yes, you had your hand up, yeah. yeah. She's just taking off from the other two questions before. Um, you know, so we understand the significance. And in fact, there was a statistic thrown to me was that 90% of the bankers in Europe are arts graduates. And um, also in India, we have Mr. Anand Mahindra, who's, who's, a, uh, who's a film uh, graduate from Harvard. Um, so um, uh, like Mr. Kilnani said, that in India, despite our history and culture, uh, the liberal art ethos and the humanities are not so evolved. And also our curriculums take from the British and it's not so evolved in that sense. Uh, what I'd like to know is, um, I know both my daughters are working in the US, uh, but the US is the epitome of liberal arts, so too when it began there uh, in the 1700s or 1800s. But despite that, the message that you get is again, similar like we get in India or elsewhere. For instance, you have the STEM visas, which are longer. Yeah. You have um, the, um, uh, the, they get more highly paid jobs immediately as compared to the other arts graduates. So can you explain that? So, so, the, so the question here in the second row, kind of, uh, the, you know, degree equality and thinking about the value of education. One, I think we have to get past the sort of one and done uh, mentality of one versus the other. Um, to, to, to the lady's question in, in the front row. Um, but the other is um, sort of thinking about holistic uh, training for, if you think of education as kind of a, th a three-part equation, it's a consumption product, right? It's what is it that you just love to do? That's an important part of the puzzle. But then you know, there is also this portion of in insurance in the future and, and sort of investment in your own well-being, and so I think it's a combination of these of these three things. Where I mean, we've got to engage with the world we live in today, which has a piece of technology as part of it, but then you know we we also have to engage with these you know fundamental human questions that root us in being able to solve for the really big problems out there. Yeah, I, I'll and just it. add one thing to that, which is I think you know particularly in a context where as we read constantly the changing nature of work and the sort of the fact that we can't assume that there's one career that we might follow through over 40 or 45 or 50 years of our life where we have to kind of reinvent ourselves at different points. It seems to me that in that context actually what we can learn from the humanities and through the liberal arts is potentially much more valuable than simply acquiring one technical skill. Uh, at, at, for example, university. So actually the capacity to reimagine and reinvent ourselves, which is something you learn by reading literature, by studying philosophy, by looking at history. That perhaps is, a, in the end, a much more important career skill, hard skill, than simply being able to perform one type of technical operation, which we might learn. Yeah. Exactly, and I, I think that um and then I know we're probably out of time. Um, I was speaking recently with the, the CEO of a large bank in New York, and he said, you know, we hire almost exclusively finance majors and accounting majors, uh, yet we look around the senior executive leadership team and the board, and everyone's a history, literature, or philosophy major. Literally everyone. He said, well, are we either hiring the wrong people, or is there something that allows these people to persist in this career for 30, 40 years and succeed to be at the top. And he said that they've kind of come to the conclusion that it's curiosity. It's persistence and curiosity are the two drivers of why there are certain people in that room and they're not necessarily the people that had the most transactional, first, best first job out of school. Uh, it was this you know, curiosity and persistence that led them to 30, 40 year career uh, to be to be in that room, and I thought that was an interesting observation. Yeah. 
That said, I wouldn't necessarily trust your banking system to liberalize graduates either. <laughs>